Good. All right. Go ahead, Chris, whenever you're ready. Brilliant. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Chris McCabe. Uh, I'm a poet, um, an editor of poetry and the UK's National Poetry Librarian. It's a real pleasure to be here in Sparkleverse. Um, I often think of the world as uh, a sparkling thing of verse, so it's become real. Um, and we've got an amazing poet who's going to read for us um, this evening, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are. Um, it's Vaughan Rapatahana, um, a Maori poet who I first met in London in 2019 when we invited him to the South Bank Centre uh, to read his work at a big poetry festival that we did there. Um, Vaughan is a real traveller. He commutes between Hong Kong, the Philippines and New Zealand. Um, or should I say Aotearoa, I'm sure Vaughan will say that much better than me in a short while. Um, he's widely, widely published um, in many different countries as well. And he writes his poetry in Maori uh, and translates into English. Um, and he will tell us more about his very, very interesting process for writing his poems and self-translating his poems later in the event. Um, he has a PhD from the University of Auckland um, and he's written about languages quite extensively, um, particularly um, about English as a hydra, um, which I'm going to ask him about shortly. Um, but as that suggests, he's a big believer in people owning, speaking and, and, and writing and reading in their indigenous languages, as he does. Um, he won the inaugural Proverse Poetry Prize uh, in 2016. He's had work um, included in New Zealand's best poems. Uh, and he's been busy during um, the lockdown period as well. He was re recently uh, virtually at the Columbia Poetry Festival, a very uh, auspicious and, and long running festival uh, in, in Columbia. Um, so welcome Vaughan to, to this event. Sure. Really, really Kia ora. Good. Kia ora. It's really good to see you, Kia ora. Um, yeah, yeah. I finally got here, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very early where you are, isn't it? It's just after three in the morning. <laughs> um, fantastic, fantastic. Um, is the sun up yet or far from it? No, 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 far from it. It's, it's literally the middle of the night. It's And it's only just become spring on the officially the 1st of September, so it's still... Makariri kick on the cold here. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just starting to get cold here as well in Liverpool, yeah. so we, we can share that uh, despite the time zone difference. Um, shortly, Vaughan, you're going to read some poems um, yes. for us, which I'm really, really looking forward to. Um, I'll just explain to everyone um, how I've worked with Vaughan um, over the last few years. So I've edited um, two books of poems from around the world. One is called Poems from the Edge of Extinction. Vaughan has his copy there, fantastic. Um, and this is a book of 50 poems in endangered languages. Um, and really we were engaging um, with this situation, this, you know, this, this um, potentially catastrophic situation with many languages around the world, uh, suggested by linguists that uh, uh, half of the world, 7,000 languages uh, may disappear by the end of this century. Um, and I was thinking about what that meant uh, for poetry. Um, you know, what would happen to all these um, kinds of poems that exist in verbal cultures um, or written cultures when languages begin to disappear. Um, so I set up at the National Poetry Library in, in the UK, the Endangered Poetry Project, and we've been collecting um, poems in different languages with the aim of sharing them and engaging people in them uh, and giving uh, you know, space for, for poets to talk about the uh, language culture and to share their work with audiences at South Bank Centre in London, but these days virtually and, and way beyond as well. Um, so I was very, very pleased that Vaughan um, gave us a poem for that book, which you'll read for us shortly. Um, the poem is I believe it's called uh, Britain in the South Seas. Yes. Would yes. you 
tell us a little bit about this poem and then maybe you could you could read it for us in both Maori and English. It'd be fantastic. I'll do that. Of course, it, 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 it's a bit of both. Uh, the Maori segues into the English. I think the best way to introduce it, Chris, is uh, to read the quote from James Bellich, who's a well-known New Zealand historian. Uh, because this is what the early British co uh, colonialists or colonists thought they would make New Zealand. So this is, this is the quote at the beginning of the poem, so it sort of leads into the poem. So Britain in the South Seas, a colonial society that thought of itself as a better Britain in the South Seas. Okay, so that's what the, the ideology of, of these plethora of settlers was, to make a better Britain, which of course the indigenous folk didn't want. So, kaori oho he pirangi tene e hoa, kaori oho e pirangi, kowe i pirangi tene e naine, kowe i pirangi, he pakeha pea, he foka pohani nui ki tene kau papa e hoa, he foka pohani tino nui, ko he fena wa tupuhi, ki nui na momo ke kone, ki nui na momo, no nui na fenua, ki nui na reo, ki nui na kau papa, e gari. Ko na tangata Māori na tangata tuatahi tonu. Wari wari tene whakaro. Wari wari tene. Ko he pākeha koe pēpēr. Kaore he peritainia i na moana tonga. Kau, kau, kau. Ka huri aho ki na tāringa o he pākeha. Whakarongo koe. Ours is a nest of conflicting birds. Doing their best to soar in a similar direction. And that sure is a white hell, isn't toward London. So that's the Tereo Māori version, which segues into the English um, conclusion, ironically. So I will read the English language version as secondary as it should be. Uh, as we'll talk more about the Hydra, this kind of relates to that. So Britain in the South Seas, sees, I don't want this, friend, I don't want. Who wants this now? Who wants this? A Pākehā, maybe? I think you probably know what a Pākehā is. Uh, a big whakapōhani to this philosophy, friend. A very big whakapōhani. As I explained when I read back in London a couple of years ago, whakapōhani is a, is a, is a the, 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 the major, the best insult Māori could give to the, the colonists, which was to show their bare ass to the colonists, which they did to the Māori, uh, to the the British royal family and the, and the and the British flag on a few frequent occasions, and I believe the Scots people have something very similar. Uh, probably call it mooning. We call it fokapohani. Uh, in this skinny country, there's many ethnicities here. There's many ethnicities from many lands, with many languages, with many philosophies. But the Maori people are still the first people. Forget this thought. Forget this. Are you a Pākehā? Maybe. Not a Briton in the South Seas. No, no, no. I will now turn to the ears of a Pākehā. You listen. So in other words, I'll speak English. Ours is a nest of conflicting birds doing their best to soar in a similar direction. And that sure as a white hell isn't towards London. I think the poem's fairly self-explanatory. Good book, though, Chris. Well done. Top of the class. Thank you. Well, merit points. <laughs> Thank you for being in it. Um, very interested in your technique in that poem because as you just explained it, it, um, it exists in two languages doesn't it, it begins in Maori and then it ends uh, as you say quite uh, ironically perhaps scathingly um, in English is that quite an unusual technique for you is it something that you've used before to to mix up Maori and English in the same poem I do that. I do that frequently, Chris. Actually, it began in, in, in English with the quote from James Bellich. Mm -hmm. So it was cyclical. Yeah. And again, more irony that an English passage castigating the English or the British settlers, starting in English, going into Old Māori, then back to English. Yes, I write many poems mixed up, a bit of both. Mm -hmm. I write some purely in English and some purely in Old Māori. Yeah. I intersperse them. Yeah, and you translate your poems from uh, Maori into English yourself. Um, yes. did it, um, does that and often vice versa. vice versa? That's what I was going to ask. So, um, 
how does a poem begin for you? Does it begin in one language or the other? And does it depend what you're writing about, how you might choose to write in English or Maori? I, I really think it's situational and it, and it depends on the uh, the topos, the, the, the topic. Some poems just come to me in Te Reo Maori. Sometimes I need to write in Te Reo Maori because it best expresses. Other times an English version comes out first and I will translate into Te Reo Maori. Other times, frequently, I, I wrote a couple of poems the other day, both languages. So I might have an English and then a Maori refrain or a, a, a counter. So I might have a, a statement in English and then a, a Maori counter repeated as in the as in our, as our own style of poetry, the song poetry, more tear tear, which are repetition of, of, of the same phrase over and over again. So I'm translating myself vice versa all the time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, very interesting. The repetition was fantastic as well in that poem. Yes. Um, and I've always been interested in your um, your image of the English language as, as a many-headed hydra. Uh, could yes. you tell us a little bit about where that idea came from and uh, and what that means to you? A little bit of background. I spent many years overseas, uh, which, of course, COVID is buggering up for everybody right now, as a teacher of English, as a second language or foreign language. So I was a, a, a mercenary myself. Uh, so I had to start criticising what I was doing when I realised that for many, if not, I won't say most, but a large number of people, we were teaching this wonderful gift to got from God, the English language, to didn't really need the language, would never use it, didn't really want to learn it. So I became my own critic and, and critic of other uh, expatriates like myself over there earning big money under good conditions, teaching English, but pushing it on to indigenous folk who didn't really need the language and would never use it. Um, my own kids in Hong Kong are an example of this. Uh, their, their first language is Cantonese. Their second language is Mandarin or Putonghua. English is about a third or fourth down the list. But, but English is mandatory in Hong Kong schools, but a prime example of not really needing that tongue. They don't use it on an everyday basis, though they can speak it if they wish to. Um, so we come up with this idea of the Hydra, which is English is spreading so prolifically and, and manifestly and continuously throughout the world, especially in uh, countries that are, not, are traditionally not English as first language communities or countries. And you might top off one head, but it'll sprout out about six more. So it's very prolific. It's very remunerative for the British uh, countries as, as uh, promulgated and, and as wanted by the British Council, just one agency. So that's the English language Hydra. Uh, and the, the, the real downside is that yes, indigenous tongues are being are suffering under this onslaught of the hydra. Yeah, it's fantastically um, pertinent, I think, and poetic image for what's happening with, with, with these major languages um, absorbing or attempting to you know absorb um, whatever is in its wake, really. Um, and how do you see the current? Um, you know, situation with uh, Maori language, because it's been a language that has um, revitalized, I guess is one word um, you might use. Um, so certainly there's a program behind the language and I believe more speakers now than, than there may have been um, in past decades. Is it um, a positive picture as you see it um, for the language? Yeah, I, 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 positive, yes, but not as positive as it can be. Uh, the language basically, almost died out. In fact, the Māori race, race is the wrong word, the Māori community almost died out as well. Uh, a lot of that to do with disease brought over by the British conquistadors. Uh, <clears throat> the language was close to extinction. It's, it's revitalized considerably since then, but there's still room for a considerable amount more uh, improvement and more people speaking to Māori Māori. Yes, the signs are positive. It'd be nice if Māori was taught compulsorily in, in all schools in the country, which it's not, uh, or at least made available, which it's not, partly to, due to a dearth of actual speakers of the language to teach it. So to, to answer your question, yes, it's not, it's not dead, it's not going to die, but I think it still needs a tremendous amount more tōtoko or support. So the, it's on a 
the lifeline is there. It's being fed the glucose and the nutrients. But I wouldn't say it's out of the woods, out of the emergency, or it's probably out of the I, I, ICU, but it's still in the hospital, it's still yeah. a patient. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how does uh, your poetry play into this? Because um, one of the ideas in the anthology was that, you know, poetry can play a part in the revitalization of a language. Um, it can connect audiences. Um, it can interest young people, for example, in, in an indigenous language that they might not otherwise see as an exciting prospect, but verbal art and performance can op often uh, kindle an excitement in a new generation. Um, how do you find people connecting with your Maori poetry and do you see it having a, an impact positively on the language more generally as well? I don't know about the last part because I'm speaking subjectively for myself, but I'm, I'm published a lot in Te Reo Māori globally. Uh, for example, I just read at Medellin only last week, and uh, I, I read some poems in Māori which were translated into Spanish via the, the third part of that triangle, the English language. So globally, at least... I can only speak for myself, poetry is being published in Māori, which is doing exactly what you're saying. It's, it's, it's arousing interest in, in, in Te Reo Māori and, and more and more being published in New Zealand in Te Reo Māori. Ironically, probably published more globally overseas than in my own country in Te Reo Māori. But um, last year, I did get poems published in Landfall, which is New Zealand's preeminent uh, literary magazine in Te Reo Māori, which is a major step, I think, forward for the language. Uh, so yes, poetry is, 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 and if it's performed as well, and it's not just virtually, but if you're actually physically in a place and you can perform it, which is what Maltia Tia are all about, that that's Maori song poetry, which I try and model much, much of my poetry on, even if it's in English, if it's performed as well, even more emphasis, more emphatic, and more interested from variety of audiences. So yes, again, the answer is, Yes, yes, and yes. Poetry in Te Reo Māori, even if it's mixed with some English or vice versa, does help uh, profile of the tongue everywhere. Absolutely, and you know, your performance in London um, was fantastic, making use of the stage, the whole space that we had, um, and really bringing the audience into your work. Um, shortly... the background, background uh, musical instruments, the yep. ko o which is the, the Māori flute yep. playing in the background also emphasizes this yes yeah yeah and you made use of film as well so there was um you know a real um multidisciplinary cross art um approach to connecting people with with, with your language world if you like um yep. sh shortly i'm going to ask you to read from no love is not dead because um you're one of a, a very small group of poets who in both of these anthologies there we go um and um, just to say a little bit about this book, um, it's 50 poems in different languages from around the world, several of them endangered languages. Um, and it really moves the focus on to this um, human emotion, which is often seen to be a universal human emotion. Um, and certainly um, love exists in, in, in all cultures. However, um, whether we're always talking about the same thing remains open for debate. Um, and really, this is what, what the book explores, um, is uh, how love is held within different languages, um, with various words for different aspects of love. Um, but also, you know, how poets interrogate and um, come in at this emotion from unusual and interesting angles. Um, and you absolutely do in your poem, Vaughan. Um, it's a, a lexicon of love, uh, I believe you've written. Um, would you like to say something about your poem or, and read it for us as well? I'll certainly read it. It's, it's actually a, a, a love poem about my wife or to my wife or for my wife, who's sound asleep next door. Uh, he papa kupu o aroha, which means a lexicon of love. Kaori he kupu ki tene reo, ki a foka ahua i a koe, i tarai ana aho, kia kite e tahi tuahua. 
kaori rawa. Miru miru, e riti tangi ki te wairaka. Mama he, he puhonga rite ki te kupa, sorry, ki te kupu a kopapa ki te kura. A tahua pono engare i ki waha tonu, ko he tanga te pai i tua atu o te whakarehu rehu. Pai ake ki a whakarere, ti kopaki i a koe i roto i te tā. Ki te noho pai koe i tua atu i te toikupu, i te tahi ture te tata i te kotoa. Kaore e taia i nga arapu ki te hopo ti aroha. So ka huri a ho ki te reo ingarihi, I'll turn to the English language and translate that. So a lexicon of love. There are no words in this language to describe you. I attempt to discover some adjectives. There are none. Bubbly, huh, sounds like a soft drink. Diligent, reeks like school jargon, beautiful, true, but so cliched. Well, a good person is beyond amorphous. Better to forgo encapsulating you in prints. You exist well beyond poetry, any formula at all. Alphabets cannot spell love. Fantastic. So that's that poem. And thank you for that one as well. You know, it, was, it was a delight to include it for um, And it, it's quite unique in the, in the book, really, because, um, you know, you're saying that you cannot possibly write a love poem in the language whilst pulling off this, you know, <laughs> incredible love poem at the same time. And I was wondering how um, does the Maori language um, compare to English in terms of what you can say about love? Um, do you, is it the case um, that there are different things you can say in one language than the other? Or um, do you have a particular vernacular perhaps for certain aspects of love in, in Maori? It's a tricky question. Think, no, not a tricky question, but I think love for us is, 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 a, is a wider concept than what's traditionally seen, I guess, from English language love, which tends to be more love between man and woman or man and man, between individuals. That's how I see love generally. This is a huge generalization uh, in the, the Western world. So many love poems, loves and songs, which are interrelated, of course, more and more and more uh, are under that individual partnership arrangement. For, for Māori, love has got several words, aroha just being one of them. Love is more, more, much more than, I won't say just, it's much more than two individuals. It's a wider concept. Love is, relates to the whole of the communities. So we've got manakitanga, which is a concept meaning, I guess it really means love of, of the community and love of people in the community and doing things for them, which is a wider aspect. It's love of the family or the whanau which in itself is an extended body. It's not just a nuclear family. So there's afi afi, which is sort of hugging and cuddling and giving love. Uh, there's afinatanga, there's kaitiakatanga, there's kotahitanga. These are all aspects, I won't go into them because there's no time, of, of love and sharing love and showing love in the wider community to other members in the community what, of whatever, whatever ethnicity. And it's, it's, it's sort of love, compassion, caring showing the caring physically what which is the afi afi so i hope that I, I, I and i guess because of those concepts you can write more into the maori what using those words because people in the maori community will understand them more to see that they're more than just a love poem to betty or bobby yeah so there's more um um shades of color if you like um in, in maori um, yeah. which perhaps, I mean, I don't know, do you, but you will, will see things that maybe um, I, I would not be able to see solely in the English language. I think that's a quite, yeah. quite interesting, interesting aspect. And um, I was going to move into dialect a little bit because it's a bigger interest area for me. Um, there's um, different um, Eastern and Western um, dialects of Maori. Is that so it's something I've read that may may not um, manifest in that way, but could you say a little bit about the dialect in, in, in light of Māori? I, I think that 
Eastern Western dialect, um, Kopapa, is a bit dated now. I think, yes, the older generations, I'll go back before that. Māori are not, a, a, we're never a group, a homogenous group. Māori are iwi, I-W-I, of tribes, different tribes who came to this country, not at the same time. All came in different waka or canoes. So to categorise Māori as one homogenous grouping is not right. So because there's different iwi, there's different, well, there were different pronunciation, different usage, different words for certain things. Uh, so in an older generation, I think that, that East and Western uh, dichotomy might have been more true because the older generation probably would have recognised someone from another tribe speaking differently, saying something in a different way. But I think now it's, it's talking about homogeneity because of the, the, the textbook use fairly much similar. And I think there's more of a, a generally recognisable English, sorry, te rau Māori, uh, which everybody can understand. Uh, the, the pronunciation is fairly uniform. Not, not, not completely. Some, some of the Western tribes still have different pronunciations of W, H and H. But again, that's, that's a generational thing. Uh, there's still some different spelling. I think that the major thing, if there's any dialects anymore, is usage. So I'll give you one example. When I first went to live in Te Araro on the East Coast last century, I was talking to the late uh, Pohatu Wano, Stone Wano, and I said, Keita Pea Kweho, which is general across New Zealand, is how are you, mate? He said, no, 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 we don't say that here. We say Keita Aha Kweho, how are you? But meaning the same thing, but a different way of expressing. And that was an example, I guess, of a slightly older generation and a different and a, and a different iwi tribal inflection of, of, of how are you? So the dialect or east-west thing, I think, is a little bit dated these days. I think it's more merging into a more general mainstream te reo Māori. Interesting. And one of the um, uh, pieces of research I've read recently um, for the UK is that our multiple dialects um, are likely in some people's view to begin to disappear over the next 50 years as a new generation um, becomes more influenced by Amer America basically through things like Alexa and Siri and um, you know the shared online sphere that that is becoming more and more prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just going to give you um, a short uh, rest for a second, Vaughan, and then we're going to come back and we're going to have uh, from you, uh, if it sounds good, um, a, a more of an extended reading of your poems um, for, for maybe 10 minutes or so. That sounds all right. Um, if you've got any to hand. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to hear some poems from you, of course, as well. Yeah, well, I, I can do that. Um, I'm going to read something um, which touches on dialect um, very, very um, gently, but um, I also want to read a, a love poem as well. Um, and I really like how in Liverpool we don't say uh, nothing for nothing. We say nothing. Um, and we say it very quickly. <laughs> um, so, like, you know, um, what are you doing? Nothing. Um, would you like anything? Nothing. Um, so I'm going to read um, this poem called Nothing in No One's Eyes But Ours. And this is for Sarah. No job. No arts council grant. No books in print. No books to print. No unsolicited emails. No emails but spam. No commute. No computer, no children, no pets, no second language, nothing but dialect. No invitations, no opening nights, no suit, no business card, no holiday booked, no restaurant, no shame, no sin, no regrets, no second chance, nothing in no one's eyes but ours. And that was for Sarah. Um, Very good. R round of applause, please, from the massive audience out there. It's three in the morning in New Zealand, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but yeah, har harping back to days when we, we had very, very little, um, but we did have thicker Scouse accents, I could say, to make up for the financial hardship. Um, so why don't we, um, we can, um, I've got a few more poems, more, but maybe hear another one from you and maybe I could read something and then you could finish off for us. Does that, does that sound good? fun. Um, I, I should have mentioned before, it's just come to my brain that I, recently, because everything's virtual these days, as I, I'll repeat myself, coronavirus is buggering everything up like traveling overseas, which my wife and I would really love to do. Um, a lot of virtual, a lot of readings virtually, and I've been doing a lot recently uh, with poets from Ireland with, with the native indigenous Irish tongue, who are, uh, I guess, anti-Hydra. So I've had a fair, a fair few shared readings of Irish men and women reading in Irish and singing in Irish. Uh, there's a chap whose name I can't remember from the Hothouse Flowers, a well-known um, music group who, 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 who took part as well. So it goes back to your point about how his house Māori getting an international profile. Yes, but it's, it's also a good deal of um, Indigenous folk sharing amongst themselves. And I understand that group from Ireland was also relating to Indigenous speakers in Bolivia, of all places. So the Māori will meet up with the Bolivians as well, virtually as well. So that's ongoing as well. So maybe the one plus of COVID is that it's bringing people together even more because they've got more time and they've got virtual uh, capabilities, except when your computer or your internet didn't work like it did for about 10 minutes, didn't for that 10 minutes this morning over here. Enough of that ramble. I'll read a background here. My son, Blake, who, who I also write a lot of poetry about, uh, committed suicide at 29 in the, year, in the year 2005. I often write about him. I, I've mentioned before, I wonder why I keep writing about him. And I've, I've come to the conclusion I write, not compulsively, but com continually about my son, whom I miss cons uh, considerably, uh, to keep him alive. So another way of writing poetry in, in whatever tongue is to keep people alive. So this one is talking to my son in a funeral home. And again, I put some Māori into it, a whakatoki at the beginning, whakatoki being a pithy saying. Uh, which is gloom and sorrow prevail day and night. This is the poem. I spoke more authentically to you during those 30 etoliated minutes than I ever did when you were alive. The stark room, shaped more like a coffin than what you lay in, quite composed, unmoved by my ascesis of angst, my agenda of guilt. The wooden floor and eavesdropper, bouncing back a farrago of belated apologies, an echolocation of mea culpa. Those faded walls, the fake flowers in a neutral vase, and the box of tissues, supplicating for the tears I could no longer summon during that one-sided confession to myself. So that was talking to my son in a funeral home and that's exactly what happened. Wonderful. Um, I, I loved um, how you described poetry as a, as a way of keeping him alive and um, yeah. uh, it brought to mind William Blake, you know, with your son being called Blake and, you know, Blake's views of art and poetry. Um, yeah kind of tapping into eternity, you know, I think it's something that, that poetry can do because it doesn't always work chronologically. It can, no. it can collapse chronology and um, open up little rips in time where um, the past seems very, very close and maybe even allows us to, to, to glimpse in, into the future as well. Um, and I realised in what you were saying about um, the Irish community, I think we've we've um, completed the the circle between Liverpool and, and Maori because um, we have in Liverpool a really strong uh, Irish uh, Gaelic or Gaelic uh, community mm. um, and a strong um, Irish Gaelic and um, you know still speaking community as well, um, and. Um, that seems to me a really interesting link between the places that we're in at, at, at this very moment because when I read in, in Scouse dialect of course it's um, it, it's drawing on um, these Irish roots um, in the 19th century where um, so many Irish people came across the Irish Sea 
from Ireland in, in the potato famine and um, um, for want of a better phrase they um, they wooed the socks of the women and had lots of babies and um, um, what was a Lancashire accent um, probably sounding maybe more similar to to Manchester or, or, or Preston or something like that became um, the Scouse um, accent with it with its dialect and hidden within there are still some some uh, Irish Gaelic phrases and um, uh, and expressions. Um, so very excited to hear that you're talking um, Vaughan with the with with the Irish community as well and. That's what poets do, isn't it? You know, connect and and and, and speak and make things happen. Um, have you found that the the lockdown period has been perhaps even better for making those kinds of connections, or just different? I think a bit definitely different because if this wasn't coronavirus, you'd be out performing and reading live, so that's different. But I think more, yes. More, more people are reaching out because they can. No one to fill in their time as well. I guess as that aspect. So yes, a lot of um, a lot of virtual readings, yes. Yeah. So now we'll hear something from you again. I hope virtually. Yeah. Yes, um, we will. Um, I'm going to read a poem, um, which is really responding to a phrase that everyone started to use. Um, um, I don't know whether anyone's picked up on it. Um, someone would say um, rather than like, "What do you think about something?" or, or, or "Could you comment?" Uh, they would say, can you talk to that? Um, and I find it quite unusual. So like uh, being an event and, a, you know, someone would say, oh, um, here's an idea. Can you talk to that idea? You know, it's kind of this uh, unusual expression uh, which took hold. So um, the poem is called Talk to That. There came a point in human interactions when people ask, can you talk to that? Not what are your thoughts or can I have your view or even what do you think? But can you talk to that? Overnight, the abstract became the object, a mischief of rhetoric that removed the person from the dialectic. Can you talk to that? What fractal was detached? What was the that that wanted talking to? Heel boy, sit, sit, get back, talk, now talk to make it sit. The question has fleas, lice, ticks. Can you thought to that? Can you think that? Can you take of that? Can you talk? Can, can you talk to? Can, can you? Can you talk to that? Very good again. And the repetition I noticed as well. Very good. Yes, I think we've both got um, a, a secret obsession with uh, repetitions, Vaughan. Mm good device so are you, are you uh, talking about v virtual performances are you, are you physically going to london and working still how's, how's the situation in the uk yeah so i've been commuting up to london um for the past uh, six months since april um, we opened the mm -hmm. national poetry library um again which felt great um and then we had some floods in the uh, unexpected mm -hmm. tropical rain no major damage but um a sign of the the world the stop start world that we're living in i guess you know um we you know we've got to be prepared for the changes in environment as well especially when you know you manage a library um but in that time i would say london's gone from um a very interesting version of a sci-fi world in which you could walk through the center of london and and see just a handful of people to you know something approaching what seems like full capacity certainly on the buses and the tube um you know so but in that context obviously it's very different for different people but uh, and some people are only beginning to emerge or you know from home working back into commuting and that kind of thing so it still feels very um tenuous if you like um i think the my sense of uh, the you know the collective psychology of people I work with is that we're prepared to stop as well uh, and change. You know, it, it's very interesting uh, this flexibility that seems to have been built into our approach. But things are happening. We we do live events, of course, like yours a few years ago, and we're planning. We have events programmed for the autumn, some live poetry, and um, we're looking to do you know festivals next year and that kind okay. of thing. 
so it's looking it's looking hopeful i would say for one absolutely and hopefully you know we'll we will have you back in person as well in uh, in a, a future future festival event or, or whatever it might be um but it's been wonderful talking to you would you like to finish off do you have another poem to to close i've off? got one other poem um this one i uh, this one i guess is a, is, is, a, is my f a way for me to 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 address the terrible situation when, when, when i talk about the the virus and the vi and the varieties of virus uh this one's kia atofai to hua ketu 2020 kia atofai kia koto fano kia atofai kia koto fanonga kia atofai kia koto hoa kia atofai kia koto kiritata kia atofai kia koto hoa mahi kia atofai kina ua ko ao Ki atafai ki na tangata o ero ata matawaka. Ki atafai ki a koto ano. Ka fakamatia to hua keto o tu twenty. Ki ta ki ta atafai. Ki a atafai. So ka huria ho a ki tereo ingarihi and uh, ano. So I'll, I'll again go back to the English language. So atafai is kindness. Be kind. The virus of twenty twenty. Be kind to your families, be kind to your relatives, be kind to your friends, be kind to your neighbors, be kind to your workmates, be kind to strangers, be kind to people of other ethnicities, be kind to yourselves, kill the virus of 2020 with kindness, be kind. Wonderful finishing with um, repetitions there. Uh, Vaughan again, but I, I remember you sent that poem to me quite early in the, in the lockdown. It's a wonderful, yep. positive message of hope to to receive, yes. and, and a, a really perfect way to end. Um, so I'll just finish by saying to everyone, you can read Vaughan's poems in in these books, um, along with a hundred other poets. Um, you can find out more about Vaughan online as well. Lots lot of his online um, virtual events are there. Um, have a double double hit um but also um thank you to Benny man festival to richard and avista in particular and emma at chambers for making this possible and finally a huge thank you for get, not least for getting up so early to yeah. vaughan uh rapata hannah it's wonderful to see you vaughan and thank yeah. you all for coming to the event and i hope to see you all soon bye bye thank you thank you Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.